All right, everybody, welcome to the, the uh, July NUC meeting. Uh, normally, uh, Steve Leak is your host. I'm filling in for him today. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, okay, so first, let's just talk about what we're going to do today. So remember, this is an interactive meeting. We'd love to have you participate in the meeting. So you can raise your hand uh, in in Zoom. You can raise your hand. That's you can do that uh, by going to reactions and then uh, choose raise your hand, uh, or you can just even just speak up. Uh, we remember also in the nurse user Slack, we have the webinars channel. So you're welcome to start some discussions in that channel. Okay, so for our agenda today, we're going to talk first about our wins of the month. People have wins. We'd love to hear about them. Um, today I learned, so things that uh, you learned that might help other users. We're going to have some announcements, calls for participation. And then um, our topic of the day is HPC workflows for scientific facilities. And so my colleague Bjorn Enders will be joining us uh, for that. Then we'll talk about uh, upcoming meetings, like any topic suggestions or requests. And then finally, uh, last month's numbers at NERSC. Okay, so let's talk about our wins of the month. So if you've not been to one of these meetings before, we just want you to show off an achievement or give a shout out to someone else's achievements. Um, so, you know, have you had a paper accepted? Did you solve a bug? Uh, did you have a great scientific achievement or an innovative use of high performance computing? Uh, so I'll just uh, share the floor for anybody who wants to uh, do uh, talk about their win of the month. Um, yeah, I have a quick one. Uh, awesome, so yes. I did a uh, weak scaling study of our code, MFIX EXA. It's a combined Alarian Lagrangian um, particle unresolved CFD code uh, with the Slingshot 11 on Promoter that's being installed right now. Um, and we're seeing uh, about a 20% overall improvement um, in time to solution. And for the particles, which are even like the most communication uh, bound part of the code. Uh, upwards of almost 40 percent and I was curious if anyone else has done so much studies with their codes like um hi William this is, this is Richard at nurse what what scale were you running at and um and what was the code again uh the code's infix exa it's a um ECP code um so the scale was eight up to 512 GPUs Okay. Oh, that's awesome. That's great results. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I see that Maruti has your hand raised. Yeah. yeah. So um, can you hear me right? Yes. yes. Okay. So uh, I have a paper that was accepted recently in advances in water resources that used NASC resources. So um, we um, we had a um, high resolution simulation model that was trained to understand um, river water intrusion into uh, mm -hmm. one of the sites at the Pacific Northwest National Lab here. Uh, called Hanford site, um, and where in which we use a DOE code such as pfloatran and E4D to generate the simulation data, and um, and use that data to train um, uh, machine learning models, where in which we used a combination of MPF or Pi TensorFlow to uh, run on uh, more than 400 nodes uh, to develop. Um, uh, scalable AI models and uh, train that models and invert for permeability field. So uh, that was that paper was recently accepted in um, the journal and uh, just wanted to highlight the uh, I highlight and thank the nurse for the resource. 
Wow, that is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing about that. Um, you know, I think that's a major accomplishment that we would we would love to uh, find out more about if you, if you would be willing to, um, you know, send us an email and we can, uh, sure. you know, we could maybe even do a science highlight. I mean, that's amazing. I love awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've got Torin. Yeah, I have uh, just a sh small uh, progress that uh, I can share that's uh, well-timed with the, the topic for this meeting. Um, at General Atomics, we've been given access to the real-time cues on NERSC and are developing a workflow for um, equilibrium analysis for the fusion experiment D3D that is on site. And uh, the goal is to develop uh, high fidelity uh, reconstructions that can be used to assist with uh, the experiment monitoring um, in the control room using the NERSC resources um, in real time. And so we have, uh, I've just tested it out this morning with some changes that were made um, at, during the downtime and I'm seeing uh, jobs launch very rapidly um, and uh, share uh, 100 processes sharing three nodes, real-time execution, which is um, a great starting point for the development we're trying to do. And we're now seeing if we can get enough progress together for uh, submitting a paper to the supercomputing uh, upcoming uh, workshop. Hey, Torin, that's great. That's great news. That's exciting. Um, I wonder, is your workflow uh, predictable or scheduled, or is this something that's just going to be kind of ongoing, um, unpredictable uh, time of need? It's a little bit mixed. Um, I think it'll be mostly predictable in that the experiment uh, generally has pretty regular runtime hours, um, startup around 9 a.m. till generally around 4 p.m. is last shot, but we've had some extensions and our, our facility calendar tends to be uh, pretty variable um, month to month throughout the year. So it's, it's a bit of both. Um, okay, but this, is, but this is something that on, that's ongoing kind of every day type of thing. It will be, that's the plan, yep. Yeah, cool, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing. Uh, do we have anybody else who wants to share a win? All right, I'm gonna take that as a no. So we'll move on to our next topic, which is today I learned. So again, if you've not been to one of these meetings, which we're talking about like what thing that you learned that was surprising perhaps, that might benefit other users to hear about. So something you got stuck on, but then you figured out, uh, be nice to give others the benefit of your experience, um, some kind of a tip for using NERSC or anything else that you learned that might benefit other NERSC users. So do we have any Today I Learned to share? I guess everybody already knew everything, so he didn't have anything. I guess that that's today I learned it should be this month I learned. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it should be. <laughs> Nobody can say anything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca, sorry for the interruption. Can I go back a little bit on the what one of the paper says? Is that from Maruti? Marathi? About the 500 some notes, is that on the CPU version or is that a GPU version? So um, uh, it's a CPU version. You can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's a CPU version. I will share the 
uh, link here right now. Um, and um, so um, the CPU version of the um, the NERSC Cori used, uh, like we used is NERSC Cori uh, Intel as well as well as uh, Knight's Landing for simulations to run, um, to generate the data uh, specific to the field site, um, use CPUs. Uh, for uh, training the deep learning models, we also used uh, CPUs for hyperparameter tuning and um, and also for um, inference. Um, we are planning to port that to GPUs, parameter GPUs using a package called Deep Hyper and Ray. Um, and that is work in progress, but whatever we did so far um, was for uh, CPUs. Did that an did I answer your question? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay, one last call for any more, any today I learned. Okay, well, um, okay, I'll give you a, a, a today I learned that I learned not today and not really this month, but recently. Um, the S account command, S A C C T, I believe I spelled that right. I'm sorry, I'm terrible at spelling out loud. Um, the S account command can tell you about your job history. Um, so you can use that um, in various ways. But uh, one thing that I learned recently was you can it, you can also use that to look up a particular node. Um, so if you want to, let's say you had a job and it failed, and you want to um, you want to see if maybe other jobs that use that node also failed. You can use that uh, feature of S account to find out, to list all of the jobs that were on that node, you know, during a certain time period or whatever. It's quite handy. So anyway, I guess we will move on to the next topic. So the next topic is announcements. So uh, Richard, would you like to give this announcement? Um, sure. So um, you know, Corey was first, the phase one was first installed in 2015. And I was just trying to look it up this morning. And I think actually you know, going into its seventh year is the nurse longest lasting system ever, which is pretty amazing to think about it. Um, but in any case, Perlmutter, uh, which has, which will have when fully configured, a CPU partition equivalent to all Cori. And that's in addition to, um, this large GPU partition, it should be um, fully operational for 2023. So our current plan, our current expectations um, is that we will retire Corey at the end of this allocation year. Um, you know, if unex we have made provisions that if, if something um, unexpected arises with Perlmutter in the meantime, we, we can extend that date um, if needed, uh, but we don't, we don't expect uh, anything to happen there. And so allocations for 2023 will be based on Perlmutter's capability. And um, then the ERCAP season is starting in less than a month. And I guess the, there'll be more talk about that at the next NUG meeting. Thanks, Richard. Um, anybody have any questions? Um, and so we, we, we are asking users that um, to let us know if they think there's something um, unique or special about Corey that, um, that they're relying on. That, and so if they're uncertain, um, if something might work or not work on Perlmutter, um, please try it now, but also let us know. And, and we'll try to address that in the meantime. Quick question, Richard. Um, so um, the I see the Perlmutter um, CPUs are um free for testing correct so correct. when can we expect that to be um that to be true it's like is there any hard deadline when after which uh, permuter cpus for testing will not be uh will not be available for free of charge ah. so right now they're still uh free of charge we're we are kind of watching the allocations and usage and evaluating um when or if this this allocation year we might have to charge for those CPUs. It's still 
it's still undetermined. You know, the system is still being configured and tested and things so that um, when, the, when the size of the system is fully realized might play into that too. So I don't have a, don't have a firm answer for you yet, but um, mm -hmm. in the meantime, I, I do encourage people to get onto those CPUs and try them and take advantage of them while they're free now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we can um, we can uh, do scaling studies or simple studies on that for free of charge, right? Yeah, for the time being, yes. Oh, for time being, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll give you plenty of advanced warning before we decide to charge. It won't be like tomorrow we're starting to charge or something. I mean, it, we'll give you at least a month before we uh, charge. I Thank think. you so much. Okay, uh, any other questions about the Corey retirement? So you all learned it first by coming to the NEG meeting, get a special announcement. Alrighty, so we'll move on. So um, all of these have been announced in the weekly email, but just re-announce re them here. So we have a lot of opportunities to participate in workshops. So. We've got the Parallel Applications Workshop Alternatives to MPI plus X Paw ATM. That one, uh, their call for papers, it's due July 29th. We've got the Workshop on Accelerator Programming Using Directives. That one, papers are due August 5th. The Combined International Workshop on Interactive slash Urgent Supercomputing. Uh, papers for that are due August 15th. The uh, International Symposium on Checkpointing for Supercomputing. Papers are due August 26th. Uh, we've got some, some good conferences or workshops that are coming up as well. So uh, week after next, we've got the Open ACC and Hackathon Summit, August 2nd through 4th. And it's it's more than just about hackathons um, or even open ACC. Uh, I think they have a really interesting program that's going on there. Um, we've got the Beyond DFT Electrochemistry with Accelerated and Solvated Techniques uh, workshop. Uh, that's going to be August 15th through 16th. Um, NERSC is providing some uh, training accounts and reservations for that workshop, although I don't think we're really involved in any other way. Uh, and then the CONFAB 22 meeting, this is ESNET's first annual meeting. That is going to take place October 12th through 13th. And so you can register for that if that seems like an interesting meeting, which I think it will be. Okay. So then as for training, so we've got these upcoming trainings. We've got the E4S at NERSC training on August 25th. Um, E4S is a curated set of scientific libraries that are all curated to work together. Um, and so I think that's a good workshop if you're interested in using libraries. Uh, we've got the our, our spin up training is going to happen on August 10th. That's not too late to sign up for that. And then we've got this AI for Science boot camp going on. That is going to be August 25th through 26th. We had originally scheduled it, I think for spring of last year, maybe. I can't remember. Uh, it didn't work out then because Perlmutter wasn't stable. and We really wanted to have it on Perlmutter. So it's going to be August 25th through 26th. Um, so please sign up for that if you're interested in AI for science. So Rebecca, can I say one quick word? more about E4S. I don't know how Please. many people are familiar with what it is, um, but it is a, a, a set of software packages that were developed um, under the X-Scale Computing Program, ECP. And what they have done, among other, th other things, is they've um, ensured that software packages are compatible, so you don't have namespace collisions and all that kind of stuff. Um, but they've done a lot of tuning, optimization, and development for GPUs and GPU-like systems, exascale systems, and beyond. And they have packaged them up in such a way that you can install them yourselves with like a stack installer. I think they have containers as well. 
Um, they're also easy to install, well, relatively easy, at least they're consistent to install at the facilities. And um, the packages contain most of the, if you looked at the, if you actually looked at the package list, you'd see most of the HPC type of libraries and, and other software that you use. The other thing that they've done is they have established a um, formal support mechanism for reporting problems that get to the developers and are tracked. And so you can file bugs and, and have a mechanism to contact the developers through that mechanism and get responses and fixes and, and support in that way. And so I think it really is a potential prototype for a uh, significant advancement in the way that HPC software is delivered, supported, installed, and accessed. So I would encourage people to try to find out more about E4S and see um, what advantages there are for you um, in using that. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Yeah. I would also second that. I'd really encourage people to uh, you know, check out this training. Um, you can participate online in the training, or you can actually come to Berkeley Lab and see us all in person if you want. Okay. Um, so our next topic is HPC workflows for scientific facilities. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to let uh, my colleague Bjorn Enders from the uh, Data Science Engagement Group at NERSC talk to you all about this topic. Okay. Can I share work? Yes. Hello, hello everyone, Bjorn. Uh, thanks, Rebecca, for introducing me. So here um, in this uh, next slide, I will talk a bit about uh, two user facilities that have workflows running at NERSC as a part of the super facility effort. And I'll give like very low, uh, very you know, brief introductions into the facility so everyone knows uh, what, what they're doing and uh, the technologies they use at NERSC. All right. Take a look. Um, these actually are uh, facilities that are close to home. They're both on our campus. First facility I'm going to talk about is the Advanced Light Source, actually one of the buildings that have been built here on the LBN campus in, at very early stages. And um, the Advanced Light Source is a um, soft X-ray synchrotron. It has about 2,000 users uh, annually who go to this uh, to the synchrotron to, to run the experiment about 50 to 100 users inside every day, 200 staff, um, 40 beam lines. So beam line, beam line, you ask yourself, what the hell is a, a beam line? So a uh, synchrotron is, is, um, is an electron storage ring. So it's a, it's a circular arrangement. The electrons go almost at speed of light in a circle. Every time they get deflected, um, they emit like a, a light pulse. So just very basic um, electrodynamics here. And these lights, um, these light pulses can be tuned by actually the, the magnets that are reflecting the electrons, or like they have specific wiggle magnets. So they can create light of very high purity and they can um, tune these light properties very well. And this makes them ideal probes for, for lots of different uh, uh, purposes, like and, and to analyze materials, chemical processes, specimen, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the uh, beam lines that's usually very common at the synchrotron. It's, it's a tomography beam line. We essentially have like a full flat beam, and you have a, a, a specimen in there that you rotate, and then you from the different from the uh, radiographs, different angles, you can re reconstruct the three dimensional volume. And I do have some some nice slides. I don't know if I can actually very well um, paraphrase what's happening here, but this is actually a sample that's um, where they were imaging, um, you know part of the this, of this wine uh, wood and there the 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 target was to take a look at all the different canals in and you know see how they constrict out in broad or uh, in not in broad and so to actually better um, understand how this how you can protect the wine you know against drop conditions and you can also do come on, okay you can also do frivolous things so one of the uh, videos they show a lot so 
is um, scanning a gummy bear. But I think the the point I'm showing this video is that these uh, they actually these scans that they're doing actually quite fast. Um, so they need um, uh, feedback about the results of their measurements in uh, in a uh, in a timely manner. All right. So the other facility is also close here on campus. It's the National Center for Lecumer Microscopy. It's part of the molecular foundry. And, the national, and they um, provide electron microscopes, um, state-of-the-art instrumentation. It's part, as I said, it's part of the molecular foundry, one of the seven facilities there. And they, uh, they also do uh, tomography. Here on the lower right, you see um, like electron tomography results. Um, where they actually kind of you know split in different parts. Um, actually, don't kind of say much to about this, but they 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 really do amazing stuff. Uh, high resolution electron microscopy, tomography, Z2 experiments, and 4D stem. 4D stem is actually the um, the make the um, technique that we have an engagement with them. So stem is called scanning. Stem is stands for scanning transmission electron microscopy. And essentially what you're doing is you're scanning your uh, electron beam across the sample and it's called 4D because instead of just you know aggregating the electron count behind the sample at each point, you uh, instead take uh, a diffraction pattern. You see that at the, the, uh, at the low part of the image, you see that there is a, a pattern forming and they have a very fast detector that can report these patterns. Um, so they take, you know, for, they scan in 2D, they take two dimensional uh, images, so that's why it's a 4D um, technique. And I, I very much encourage you to read the, the new center announcement of it below in this, in this slide. So what is this? It has to do with HPC. Why do they need to work with us? And um, for, for Ensign, it's quite obvious. They have these, uh, they they take like uh, thousands of images per second. Each image, you know, uh, it's a couple of megabytes. And then, the, and then this meets this a very, very high data rate. I think it's 400 gigabits per second that this is the data rate that the, that the instrument can take. But the uh, synchrotrons have many beamlines, also have detectors at each beamline. And as they're getting upgraded, they need they get better and better light. It means they can take more and more data. And so they're actually going into the, they're actually having this, um, they're waiting for this freak event in the future where they actually can't take up with it anymore. So that they, they're, they're starting to put their workflows on HPC machines in order to you know, get a hold of the data. So I want to move the data here. I want to analyze it. Um, that's the that's the main um, yeah, impulse. All right. So um, it's not really news because it's our, our neighboring facilities. We've known about this for a while, but we've known about this also for as part of uh, an, an, uh, a, as part of the super facility project where we've been asking you know uh, all the different programs and other science you now. Uh, what do you do at NURSE? And then a high fraction of them actually identify, oh, we're doing data analysis, et cetera, uh, essentially. So, um, yeah, so this, this getting a hold of the data and, man, and, and building data towards and analyzing the data, that's, uh, that's a, it's a main, um, uh, main draw for these facilities uh, to work together with NURSE. And to make it a bit more um, uh, structured, uh, here, oh, here at Elvin, I've created a super facility project where we can actually Try to match, uh, you know, network HPC and experiment facilities kind of work together, and that created one of these nice, nice plots. We actually can see, okay, well, on the left side, we have all the different um, partnering um, uh, EOD facilities, and on the on the in the columns, we have all the different technologies um, that they could potentially use. And so we made this this chart to see, like, you know, how can we, you know, make the make the development, you know, more structured. And here on the left side, you ALS and NSAM, they have like a few um, uh, technologies in common, for example, the API and SPIN. But there's a whole bunch of other things like data movement, data, data dashboard. I want to highlight though the, the SPIN and the API here because it was instrumental for the success. Um, and if you haven't heard of SPIN, I mean, I've probably heard of SPIN before. And Rebecca said there's SPIN training next. So you should, you should go. SPIN is really, really useful. So SPIN is our, is our platform for services, and it can be used for science gateways, both from interest databases and other network services. And you, from within SPIN, whenever you have like, you, when you de deploy something in SPIN, you can access our HPC file systems. 
and you can use public or custom stock images, really useful. So essentially all our, all, my, all the science engagements that I'm with, they all deploy the software on skin, uh, spin. <laughs> so, and you're on the right side, you see, uh, you know, um, you know, the selection of what other projects might be, might, uh, uh, might be using spin for. And the other <clears throat> interesting technology that we're offering is the SuperSet API that's relatively new. Um, the API is a unified programmatic approach to access NERSC. So essentially you want each uh, endpoint to, to reflect a certain action you can do on NERSC. So you don't actually have to go on Iris. You don't actually have to log in anymore. This should be a thing of the past. Instead, you, you know, get a client and talk uh, with our REST API. The, the authentication is very standard, very modern. Uh, we have an extensive range of documentation. You go follow this, just follow this link here. Uh, but we also have like an interactive Swagger documentation. I can just, I was going to quickly move over here to the right. So if you just go to API of API version 1.2, you can see all the different endpoints that we offer here. Like the, for example, status endpoint can be used to, to get the system status. Actually, let's just try this once here for you. I think that's possibly works. It does. All right, so you see, I, I requested the general system status, and here you get like all the different systems that probably we provide. Like, for example, you see Permoda uh, is currently active, and Cori is currently active, at least before we call it uh, the API. But also others, all for other stuff like the compute endpoint that you need to place jobs, you know, accounting endpoint to look at how much uh, uh, compute you use and, you know, and organize your groups, et cetera. Uh, really quite helpful. So I encourage you to take a look. Um, oh, also, please, anytime interrupt me if you have a question. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I might be raising a bit. Right. So the, the overall vision for the API is that all nurse detection is callable, and we have like a range of tools in the background that assist you with complex operations. All right, I'm going to um, the, the nice bits and, and explore a bit of the use cases that Ensign A has been using most for. So I've been telling, uh, talking about that Ensign has electron microscopes, and on our left side, you see um, this, uh, this, this block here is the electron microscope. And uh, the detectors of the 40 stem camera have a bunch of FPGA modules, and each of them records at 100 gigabits per second to uh, a range of four receiver PCs, and they push the data onto a local um, flash server. So they usually capture uh, 50, uh, 650 gigabytes of data in 15 seconds. And the, the um, old workflow was to you know push it 50 seconds to the RAM of the receiver PCs, then move it over to the flash storage, takes 140 seconds. So that's, you can't really change that much. It's like the, the their um, yeah, the kind of a fixed um, fixed time in their uh, workflow. So it's, uh, the the, the um, aggregated bandwidth here is eighty gigabits per second. And then they would do um, uh, um, um, an operation that called counting. Essentially, it's reducing uh, all that detector data into electron counts and saying, you know, here here an electron hit the detector at this and this pixel. Uh, that is an event. So make it they make it from like just um, like arrays of of um, um, detector data into event data. Essentially, that's their counting procedure. That's why sparse HD five cell put. Now they built uh, an app called Distiller on Spin, and then and Distiller talks now with the API. Uh, for example, it emits compute jobs, and in these compute jobs, they actually um, instruct NERSC. Uh, the the compute now is to pull the data from their from their uh, server either on our either on a, our file system or even better on our scratch system the quarry or permuter and then immediately afterwards they count the data and make a reduction that's why the errors are thinner here so there's, there's less data uh, that it eventually lands in the community files so they have like a direct copy workflow and they have the reduction workflow and then they used it in the the beauty of this is they get a very nice interface and they could um, their, their turnaround speed with this, um, with this setup. And this is essentially how it, how it looks like. It's a, a catalog app 
you know, on the right side, you see all the different data sets they take. They can they can rename it, um, and they can uh, perform action on it. You see on the uh, left, maybe a bit of small, just right under the image, you see this transfer and this count button. That transfer is just transferring to uh, the community file system, and count is transferring to Scratch and then counting afterwards. And I do have a video for this, showing this in action. See, they take a look at the data sets. I think this is a preview that's automatically generated um, in the locally. And um, you now they're taking a different one. And press all the buttons. Yeah, count button right there. Provide a parameter, and that actually instructs uh, a templated um, job script uh, that is executed with an API call. And speed up, and you see the state is a check mark there. So they're done. It's kind of unassuming, and it's uh, but that's also uh, that's also what we want. We want the API to be able to be integrated into your apps, so that you know for the user at your um, that's sitting at your experimental station, that they don't only have to they they don't actually know that this is happening. They just click the buttons for the app that you provided, and it's kind of a nurse inside you know experience. <laughs> All happens behind the scenes. Um, this is the the architecture for Distilla. You see, when you start start building this, gets a bit more involved. And you know, if you really want to know more, I think you should get in touch with Chris uh, Harris at Kitwell or Peter so with Ensem. But essentially, if you go if you go to the lower page, to the lower part of this, there is the single page web app that is deployed in Spin. It it talks with an uh, with a wrapper around this entire interface. They have an own wrapper, fast API wrapper for their for their services. And they have a like a there's a split um, a split architecture. They have they have some they have some process that run on their local machine that actually you know checks if new data is coming in and reports these events to uh, a Kafka message bus. And also they have a like a server that runs on Spin that actually initiates commands to the API and also uh, talks with this Kafka message bus. So they actually. Um, uh, using using Kafka very extensively. But once everything is kind of aligned right, they just initiate uh, a job that does a BBC copy, uh, a BBC copy from the, the server onto NERSC. All right. Um, so what is the the key features that Ensign were using? They have a they have a they the lucky um, Situation they have a direct link into the Nest network, but you can also do, you don't need to. You can also make a pull from from other parts. You don't have to be in the Nest network. Just be a bit slower. They're using the real time queue to actually run uh, these jobs, so they know that the turnaround is is quickly. Um, for specifically for Cori, because Ari is a different network, um, it's not Ethernet. So they have this and there's some it's the border nodes that have to you know, translate the the transfer. Uh, they have to translate the the message the the data packets into a uh, query, so they have to go through like water nodes. So they have to there's a Slurm plugin that allows a balanced pull across the water nodes. They use spin of course to host distiller. They use the API to talk with NERSC for everything really. And um, what you didn't see here, but they do have a switch in their app that they actually can say, oh, I'm using Cori or I'm using Perlmutter, and that actually that switch actually is informed. By the status API, so they can they have a drop down menu and they have a little you know greenish or reddish thing that says you know call is online or permit is online, so they can actually you know decide you know based on which based on which systems actually available uh, where they're going to run the workflow. I think that's that's pretty cool. And of course, the whole software stack is containerized and runs in Shifter. All right? Any question for this before I move on? Just wanna. Give you a chance to ask something. Doesn't seem the case. You can also ask later. Um, all right. So NSM focused on having like this. Uh, they, have, they have one instrument that really want to make. Um, you know, uh, we don't want to get rid of the data, put it to nurse, and have the analysis runs. Really, kind of a, a tighter focus, but that make and a, a very integrated product that they made together with Kitware ALS. Had a different focus, and they wanted, their focus was to build centralized data services 
for all their and for all their users essentially. We're starting with one beam number, they actually want to scale it out. And the the it's kind of a confusing um graph to the right, but they essentially they want to the they want to give like the full circle experience so you could collect data. Um, you might do some edge computing, you put it into uh NERSC or um, any other HPC facility. And then once it's once the data arrives at NERSC, you can add do analysis in Jupyter and you can use that that analysis you know as a feedback mechanism mechanism to to decide what you want to do next. But you know all of this should be you should scale out all the users and should um uh yeah it's essentially be very seamless too. So um right what's uh what's the pipeline look like? Um <clears throat> so it's a linear pipeline more or less um what they have been implemented so far so they have a um the beamline uh, at least one of the beamlines the tomography beamline there's a data mover app that actually copies the data onto NERSC using uh, globus and then it sits on our in one of our store on our storage systems and then they have a, a, a separate service a system spin that takes a look at the data that has arrived and ingests that in a catalog app that catalog app is based on scikit it has been customized for ls and it runs in spinner of course you know to ingest the metadata it has to have access to the nose file systems and then once it's there you know the idea is you have the you can view your data in this catalog app and then you can switch over to analysis tool to actually do something with it and then re-ingest the data um, back into the catalog so you know the you 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 have like some uh you have the scikit app to find your raw data sets you go you switch over to like a Jupyter workflow and then you do something with it you can make analysis and this one gets ingested again into your catalog and I do have another short video for this I'm just just going to show like the beginning but this is the um the scikit user interface and here you see a whole bunch of um data that has been collected and what happens here is that he looks up um, the the place where the data actually sits um, in the catalog. Um, I'm just gonna jump over here, and then he enters it into uh, a Jupyter notebook to actually pull the data into an interactive Jupyter notebook, do something with it, um, and puts it back. There we go. So that's one aspect of what they were doing, but they, um, they don't. They not only want to to able to to pull the data out of this catalog app. They also want to give a very customized Jupyter experience. So they now they have like these uh, huge amount of users, and essentially those are different user groups have different needs, and they also don't want to share that data with other user groups. So they want to actually have silo each of their user groups into. Um, yeah, they want to silo each of the user groups, and that's why they want to use this entry point feature that we have in Jupyter now, and essentially uh, run their own uh, Jupyter Hub, uh, Jupyter Hub experience, and then it's, it's added with all their their own apps. It has only access to their folders, and um, in this in this case, they can essentially you know collect data, and then for each uh, work group, then the Beamline scientist instructs them here. You know, you can now go on uh, Jupyter. You know. Uh, pick this particular entry point and then what spawns for them is a, a, a Jupyter Hub or Jupyter Notebook that essentially only shows their data and then they can work on it and um, do the analysis you know um, themselves <clears throat> uh, they guided uh, through it from the ALS login page also pretty cool how they integrated they have a like, remote access control and compute uh, um, interface and that guides them to you know, the services locally and the services uh, at NERSC. So what ALS was using for the success is, uh, you know, they use file transfer with Globus. They use the um, Globus Collab endpoint so they can send to send data to NERSC and it arrives uh, in the name of the machine account. That's very useful if you want to uh, have multiple people have access to this data. Um, I also use the global sharing feature, but that's like a, a separate story. I'm not I'm not showing here. They use Spin to deploy their customized SciCat. Um, they used the uh, API for manipulating access control on those files, and of course, they use Jupyter. And same as for Ensem, their um, their software is containerized and deployed with Shifter and Docker. And they also use 
HPSS extensively to archive the data because they have a whole lot of them. All right, that was everything. Thank you uh, so much for your attention. And there is two links I want to point out. One is the um, super facility case studies, where essentially uh, for super facility, we made um, a project, a final project report, where you can read everything a super facility has done. And it's linked in the top of this uh, page in our docs. And here I was, I'm, I'm pulling out some of the information informate and augmenting it. And essentially what you can do is you can go through, um, you can read it up and you can follow the links that should direct you uh, to the relevant technologies of our nurse doc pages. So you can essentially just read this and say, oh, I like this and click on the links. It should guide you to the right point. And hopefully that gives you some inspiration from what you can do yourself. And if you want your own story published, maybe you can, can reach out and then you know, it would be interesting for other users, you know, if you have more case studies up. And the other link that's in the slides is the general um, super facility page on nurse.gov. And here you can see a lot of like, all of the activity of super facility is linked here to demo videos, slides, uh, everything. So I really recommend uh, you know, taking a look there too. All right, um, that was everything. Thanks so much for having me. And I'm gonna stop my share. Or, or do you ask anybody has a question for stop sharing? Doesn't look like it. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Bjorn. That was really, really interesting. Really, really appreciate you sharing that. And the, the good news is this meeting is being recorded. So we're going to post it on our YouTube page. And if anybody has any other questions, they might, they might reach out to you then. Okay, so next, uh, I'm going to share my screen again. And uh, it's going to be the last things that we are uh, going to talk about today. So coming up, we have a few plans for um, for our upcoming NUC meetings, but of course, we're really interested in anything that you all might want to offer uh, as, you know, some lightning talks or about your research or, you know, whatever. Um, so in August, our topic is going to be ERCAP, since ERCAP will have just opened at that point. Uh, in September, we'll probably talk about the, the NUG annual meeting and what's going to happen there and how cool it's going to be. And then in October, instead of having this meeting, we will have the NUG annual meeting, and it'll be the last week of October, I believe. Uh, and again, we'd love to hear from you all. If you have some lightning talks you might want to give about your research that you're using NERSC for, we'd love to hear that. Okay, so last month's numbers. Um, so uh, I'm afraid I was not able to get the Cori utilization number, uh, but the large jobs number, so that's jobs that were running on at least one eighth of the machine, uh, that's 1,024 nodes or more. Uh, we had 41.71% uh, of, of all hours went to those types of jobs. Uh, we had 642 new tickets from you all last last month, and we closed 643 tickets. So now our ticket backlog is at uh, 590. So those are all the numbers that I could provide, and that kind of concludes the formal portion of the meeting. So uh, if anybody has any questions or would like to talk about anything, we can do that for, you know, nine minutes, I guess, uh, or we can just let everybody go. So. Any questions, comments, ideas? Rebecca, I have a one question. When you say it's large jobs, what is uh, considered a large job there? Okay, good question. So a large job is considered to be a job that runs on at least one eighth of the machine, the total number of nodes on machine, rounded down to the nearest power of two. So on Cori, it is, Jobs that are using at least 1,024 nodes. Oh. How long do you have any uh, execution period you think is qualified rather than just some simple test to reach that scale? Uh, 
Okay, so we never know what you do on the note, right? <laughs> okay. Um, but ideally, what we hope that you're doing is running a big job that uses MPI uh, on the nodes. And, and surprisingly, um, when I've looked at these types of jobs, most of the jobs are, are fairly short, you know, a couple of hours tops. Uh, they don't tend to be like a 48 hour job. Uh, we see we see more jobs that use few nodes that are very long uh, in, in wall time. So, okay. yeah. And that could be scalability issues or because of budgeting. Yeah, it could be anything. Um, I think, yeah, there's just not, maybe there's just not as as much that you need to do while you're using 1,024 nodes, you know? You've, yeah. It, you're, you're probably using it like uh, maybe to capture that much, um, you know, that much memory in your job hmm. or, um, or you're using it to just get stuff done quickly, right? So. Um, if you run a job that's 1,024 nodes or more, uh, you, you also get a, a discount on the uh, on the charge. So I think it's a 50% discount. So half off if you if you run on 1,024 nodes or more. So don't run on 1,023. <laughs> run on 1,024. Right. Um, so every power of two get the discount. Uh, if you're running on 1,024 nodes or more, you get the discount. Oh. So if you're running on any number between 1,024 up to like 9,000 or, or something, however many nodes that we have on the machine, uh, you get the discount. Okay. Thank you. Oh, by the way, the, the, the meeting, not NAG meeting in October, is that in person or virtual? It is going to be hybrid, so you can either come in person or we will also have it virtual. And we are going to hold it at Berkeley Lab um, because we we know what kind of AV uh, facilities are available in order to make it a quality hybrid meeting. Okay, thank you. Torin, I see your hand up. Yeah, this kind of goes back to the announcement that uh, Corey's retiring. Um, what I've seen nurse do in the past is generally a system is retiring to make way for something new. Can you say anything about what that is like or what that timeline would be? I can't say much about uh, nurse 10. So that'll be our next system. Um, so just for people counting along, um, Corey was our eighth system that we procured in the history of nurse. Uh, and then uh, Perlmutter is our ninth system. And then the future system is NERSC 10. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I can't say all that much about it, except for that we have been already working on NERSC 10 for several years. And, and yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna remove Corey uh, in part so that we will be able to support NERSC 10 when we finally get it. Um, we certainly don't have enough power or space to have three machines at once. So we definitely need to take down Corey. And like Richard said, Corey is a, a pretty old system at this point, uh, which makes me feel like I am officially a long timer at NERSC because I started when Corey was just being commissioned. So. Yeah, thanks. I hope we can hear more as uh, the year comes to an end and Corey does go down. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll we'll tell you more when we know more. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? I'm going to take that as a note. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next time.